I'm delighted to have the opportunity to present on what I consider a very important topic, uh, artificial intelligence and theological ethics. There hasn't been nearly as much engagement between artificial intelligence proper uh, in the realm of computer science and ethics. There's a need for much more. Uh, required ethics courses have begun to become part of computer science programs, uh, computer engineering programs, but it remains rather superficial and certainly doesn't bring to that area what uh, an in-depth, detailed study of ethics uh, has to offer. Theological ethics is rather distinctive in a number of ways. Uh, we'll explore some of those in this talk. What's noteworthy is that if, uh, if there's been a dearth of engagement between ethics and artificial intelligence, theological ethics has also engaged only in uh, what I can only characterize as superficial ways, in the sense that <clears throat> Oftentimes, it has remained at the level of uh, science fiction. Can an android be a person? And the engagement with those subjects has not always been uh, particularly profound or insightful uh, or detailed. More to the point, though, there are some more pressing things that ought to engage our attention if we're interested in theology, ethics, and or artificial intelligence but especially if we're interested in the intersection of these. Now, as a science fiction fan, let me say that I think the question of whether an artificial intelligence can be a person is an important one. I'm not sure whether it's an important one because we are likely to ever achieve that sort of technology. As a science fiction fan, I love stories about warp drive and interstellar travel at faster than light speeds. I love stories about time travel and yet I'm not persuaded that either of those is a realistic technology. I enjoy the Star Trek transporter as a way of uh, the original series having saved money on special effects, but I don't think we're ever going to be able to beam down to a planet. The question of whether an artificial intelligence can be a person is interesting because it helps us understand what we mean by a person. And so it's useful, much like time travel scenarios and other things, as a philosophical thought experiment and can help us to plumb areas of ethics that we might not otherwise be able to. But I think that for those of us interested in theological ethics and computer science, there are more pressing questions. And these two face serious questions or, and need to face more serious questions than they sometimes do about whether they are likely to be realized. They relate to things that we've been promised are going to be here uh, within the next few years, the next 20 years, the next whatever. And yet, uh, they are not here yet, and we don't know whether they actually will be. But they're worth asking about, nonetheless. And those are questions about uh, robots in the workplace and how they might impact work. Robots in healthcare, uh, artificial intelligences as the basis for uh, Googling and search results, uh, social media algorithms, and the information bubbles that we find ourselves into, uh, find ourselves uh, isolated from one another in. And things like automated weapons, automated vehicles. A number of books have engaged with artificial intelligence and have offered a year as the title. And these, I think, are indicative of both the hopefulness and the, the danger of trying to predict where things will go. Uh, two relatively recent ones are AI 2041 and 2084. And one wonders whether those book titles will quickly seem the way that uh, George Orwell's 1984 Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 seem to us now. Predictions of the future often are in some ways not nearly optimistic enough, and in other ways 
far too optimistic in what we'll be able to accomplish in the time span in question. The computer on the original Star Trek seems both uh, ahead of its time in its uh, voice interface and rudimentary in that it, it the show envisages computers taking up uh, rooms and being these enormous things. And our contemporary uh, computers have far exceeded what the original series envisaged in a number of ways. Let me offer a quote from uh, Kai Fu Lee, uh, one of the contributors to 2041. It's uh, a jointly authored book that combines uh, science fact uh, or futurism based in science and science fiction storytelling. And Lee says, Aspects of AI development deserve our scrutiny and caution, but it is important to balance these concerns with exposure to the full picture and potential of this crucially important technology. AI, like most technologies, is inherently neither good nor evil. And like most technologies, AI will eventually produce more positive than negative impacts on our society. Think about the tremendous benefits of electricity, mobile phones, and the internet. In the course of human history, We've often been fearful of the new technologies that seem poised to change the status quo. In time, these fears usually go away, and these technologies become woven into the fabric of our lives and improve our standard of living. There's reason to be hopeful, but being hopeful or pessimistic or a combination of both really depends on what we think is likely and where the technology is headed in the short term. A technology may have great prospect to benefit people, but that doesn't mean that it will be used that way in the near future if ethics and ethicists don't make their voices heard. On the other hand, uh, things might turn out very poorly in the longer term if we don't warn of long-term ramifications that might be missed in the early developments. In a work from 1980, there's an articulation of Mor Morvec's paradox that emphasizes one of the challenges that faces artificial intelligence. It is comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. And while there have been improvements in both perception and mobility, uh, the perceptron and uh, developments in robotics have certainly come a long way. There's still a great deal of truth in that. And a lot of our artificial intelligence is very, very good and impressive even, uh, outpacing humans in playing Go or doing other things. And yet does not have common sense, does not understand the game, feel, will feel no relation at winning. And so the question of whether computers can be intelligent may be, as one author has put it, likened to uh, the question of whether a submarine can swim. Um, it is not swimming. It is doing something very different, and in some ways is doing it better than uh, swimming would intend. And so what machines do may be very different than what human minds do. And I'd like to say from the outset, even though we'll come back to this later uh, by way of conclusion, that many authors think, and I concur, that it is in our best interest to focus our main attention and our main visioning on how machines can help humans uh, do what we do better. How they can help uh, take over certain things so that we can do the things that are unique to us. Rather than insisting that machines will never do certain things, or assuming that they will take our place in every regard, uh, envisaging where the interface is, the collaboration uh, that will optimize uh, and allow each to do what they do best, so that the things that emerge when those two powerhouses of machine intelligence and human intelligence are combined uh, can, can be on full display. So, as I've said, questions about whether an android can be a, soul, be a person or have a soul are interesting and important, should not be neglected, but we should focus on things that are 
in development, right, are beginning to make appearances. And precisely because the machines that we're developing, whether autonomous vehicles or uh, robotic weapons, are unlikely to have the capacity for human judgment. Anything like intelligence in the human sense, it's that much more important that we ask questions about ethics and what it would mean to embed our ethics in the way we program these devices and these algorithms and machines. So, how wrong can we be? Uh, I've already indicated that often we predict things wrong, but to give one example, 2007, uh, there's a book that predicted that computer technology would calm cultural conflict. And as somebody living in a context in which we've seen computers contributing to divisions between, uh, between human beings, between people aligned with different parties, different religions, I want to say that uh, what we've seen is rather different. So the key ethical contribution to this ought to be uh, an emphasis on our need for humility, uh, both in terms of recognizing how wrong we might be when it comes to our pessimism about what technology might accomplish, but also in terms of our optimism about what technology might accomplish. So let me talk briefly about theistic ethics. There are debates about whether theistic and non-theistic morality ought to be different. Uh, should it simply be humanism, humaneness, empathy informed by scripture? Is there anything shared sufficiently between different theistic systems that we can talk about a shared theistic framework or even shared Abrahamic reasoning. But one thing that we can say, I think with confidence, is that theistic morality, theistic ethics, does differ precisely because of the input of uh, scriptural and long-standing philosophical and cultural and religious frameworks. And those shape and influence, even uh, those traditions that may be aiming to be primarily uh, humanistic, even if in a religious sense. And so there are lots of questions that we might ask, such as, can an AI be an other to whom uh, a principle such as the golden rule applies? But first and foremost, the traditions of Christianity, of Islam, of Judaism, have in common certain principles that emphasize things that one doesn't always find in non-theistic ethical systems. Uh, concern for our fellow human beings, even in self-sacrificial ways. All systems of thought ethics uh, generally tend to recognize and acknowledge that unless there is some respect for uh, individual rights and uh, the right that individuals have to autonomy, to property, to things like that, then one's own rights will not be protected. And so oftentimes one will appeal to self-interest in order to safeguard the rights of others. A theistic ethical engagement ought to do better than that, uh, ought to at least aspire to uh, making room for self-sacrifice, uh, to uh, valuing the other simply for uh, the other's sake and recognizing that in as much as anything that we create as human beings stems ultimately from that divine creativity uh, that is responsible for us, it has a positive place in, in a theistic ethical framework. So let's apply some theistic principles uh, and as well as general ethical principles to some of the AI realities and near future possibilities that we need to think about. And let's begin with one that is a current reality, which is uh, Googling uh, and the presence of technologies online that generate text, that search through huge amounts of data, and that are capable of engaging with uh, human-generated content as well as uh, data in ways that individual humans and even lots of humans, uh, maybe even all humans working together, would not be capable of. Uh, there simply is too much information for human beings to sift through it, and yet search algorithms are capable of taking 
essentially the entirety of the internet and and doing things with it, taking the entirety of at least th those books which have been scanned and tracking uh, keywords and their use across time and things of that sort. And so there are real risks in the uh, algorithms that we've been developing because uh, even, well, and perhaps precisely because some people have mistakenly assumed that turning to technology, we will achieve a greater impartiality. We will eliminate bias. And while there is some potential for computers to eliminate human bias, that only is possible if we program algorithms in that way, and if the data that is generated by humans and then fed into these algorithms does not contain bias, and inevitably it does. And so this is crucially important to think about. Right? There was uh, an uh, open AI development, right? a, a GPT-3, right? Generative Pre-Trained Transformer 3, which was able to take text and then produce new text on that basis, and it generated text that had an anti-Muslim bias. Uh, it associated Muslims and terrorism. And it didn't do that because it's impartial and that's the way things are. It did that because the data set that it was given was online discourse, and online discourse included uh, human uh, bias against, you know, non-Muslims biases against Muslims, stereotypes, uh, misperceptions, and these are issues that need to be addressed. And the question of who is responsible when these things happen is also important. Right? Computer tech companies often insist that they're not to blame when their platforms or bots misbehave in this way, because it's what the public does. Right? It, these things are kind of like popularity contests, and that's, that's a dangerous thing. But of course, we're seeing more and more that democracy is a popularity contest, and that's very risky. Um, as much as I support democracy, there are risks to the issue of uh, smaller groups' expertise and um, superior contribution to certain discussions. Countries often make laws that restrict the availability of addictive substances, and social media algorithms generate content that feeds to our innate desires, uh, both in terms of its sensationalism and its a sort of pandering to our predispositions and our uh, political and religious alignments. And so it can both isolate us from uh, information about others, and so expose us to increasing amounts of stereotypes, and can also uh, contribute to something that at least is addiction-like. Feedback loops are a danger for machines and humans alike. Uh, machines can generate text, and if, as in the instance we just saw, a machine generates biased text, discriminatory text, and then that text goes online, future iterations of machine learning will take that text generated by machines and use it as a basis for their further development. And so that means that computer-generated computer nonsense text that there's a lot of online, becomes part of what machines learn to use in generating text. And that can uh, ex accentuate the amount of nonsense that's being generated. Right? There's, there's risk there. And so feedback loops and information bubbles are a danger to our machine creations and to human beings alike. Misinformation is a serious problem in our time, and technology is contributing to its dissemination, but sometimes it can contribute to its generation. When you can survey large amounts of data and find obscure uh, points of contact that might simply be due to chance, as human beings use the same language over and over again, uh, language has a limited number of possible expressions, it's possible to construct connections where uh, these really have no basis in reality. And misinformation, conspiracy theories, cause harm. 
uh, sometimes in violent ways, but they contribute to discrimination towards hatred, and in doing that, they they vi violate a number of commandments that are central to most theis theistic ethical systems. So now let's move on to some things that are more futuristic. Robots and machines are going to continue to be uh, making an impact in healthcare. AIs can already help with diagnosis and can help with surgery, allowing for precision of uh, intervention that might not be possible in the future. And a couple of sources relevant to uh, care for parents uh, in the Quran. Uh, it says to be good to parents, relatives, orphans, the needy. Uh, in the Bible, there's an emphasis on honoring the father and mother, which also comes up in the New Testament. And providing care for an elderly parent, right? say getting a nurse in to care for an elderly parent, could be treated as a, a disregard for one's duty, right? getting someone else to do what the child is responsible to, to do, but we realize that if a, a parent who is unwell, uh, who is elderly, needs specialized care, it could actually be superior. And so the question of whether robotic care could ever be an adequate substitute for, or even exceed what a human caregiver could, is worth asking. Even when it may not be an adequate substitute, it's worth thinking about whether getting a robot for an elderly parent uh, to provide companionship might be equivalent to or better than uh, providing a pet to allow for companionship when one is out of the house working. A dog or cat cannot notify you if the elderly parent falls down or has a heart attack or is uh, unwell, whereas a robot would be able to do that, presumably in most instances. And in some cases, robot caregivers might allow for uh, mobility for other things and allow a certain amount of autonomy to uh, elderly individuals, uh, including our parents. So the question of what our responsibility is by way of providing care via surrogates, human and or robotic, are things that ethical systems need to wrestle with. And there's no answer that's simply given in the tradition. One has to come up with new answers to these questions. They simply were not asked because the, the technology did not exist to, to achieve these things in the past. Thinking about animals, right? there are questions about humane treatment. And within both uh, the Quran and the Hadith, even more so in Islam, right? being kind to animals, uh, most ethical systems view kindness to animals as appropriate. And while it's unlikely that we're going to have human level artificial intelligences in the very near future, at least in my opinion, and we may never have them, at least in the sense of sentient beings, it may be that some of our machines are already akin to animals and their intelligence. Uh, they are not as empathetic as a dog might be, but they can do some things with a greater degree of intelligence than any animal that we might uh, try to play a game with. And so, does that mean that they should be treated in a certain way? Uh, should they have any rights? Not necessarily human rights, but the rights that animals often have in a society. The appearance of a machine is also worth thinking about. We empathize with cute animals in a way that we don't with less cute animals. And the way a machine looks, the way an AI looks, might actually influence us. We might be more concerned about cute, unintelligent robots that merely simulate certain kinds of personal behavior than we would be about a genuine intelligence in a box. When it comes to work, do humans have a right to work? Do we have a need to work? And does it have to be work that earns money in the traditional sense? Robots can take our place in a lot of jobs, and it may be that 
it will be unrealistic to expect that humans will be consistently employed in the workplace. Uh, not that there won't be places for employment, but to expect everyone to be able to find employment, or even most people to find employment, maybe something that changes. And people may be able to do things like you know, create art and write, care for elderly parents, and be paid for that if the profits generated, the wealth generated by robot workers, is spread equitably. And so it's important to avoid misapplication of uh, proof texts in religious traditions. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.10 in the New Testament is one notorious example where uh, Paul's words that those who do not work ought not to eat are often misapplied and used as a weapon against uh, the impoverished and against those who would be happy to work if they could find gainful employment in a cutthroat capitalist context. As society changes, as the economy changes, how should our thinking about work change and evolve? There are many other questions we could ask. Uh, I will come back to this if there's interest, but can a machine offer a valid prayer? Right? What does prayer entail? What makes prayer meaningful? Uh, all religious traditions develop habits of prayer which can become ritualistic so that we run through them maybe without even really engaging our minds fully. Uh, in no tradition is that considered ideal, but it does happen. And so could a machine ever offer a valid prayer? Uh, can a machine offer a valid call to prayer? Uh, what is the role of technology in these things? If nothing else, asking these questions can help us to think about the meaning of prayer within our various religious traditions. But let me focus more attention on things like driverless cars. Uh, I will not read in its entirety this article from uh, an issue of Wired uh, not that long ago, which was about Muslim scholars working on uh, what, what it means to engage with uh, artificial intelligence within the context of Islam. And there is a recognition that there are trade-offs in healthcare and so, in given the fact that we need to make uh, tough choices, artificial intelligence may help with that process. Um, and we'll find that the trolley problem comes up, and I wanted to mention that um, Al-Ghazali famously came up with a, a sort of an 11th century version of the trolley problem. So, in the case of driverless cars, that term is really quite problematic in as much as at the moment we do not have cars that are capable of driving themselves in the way that humans do. Uh, they cannot avoid um, all kinds of obstacles, recognize what an obstacle is and what it means in a meaningful way. Uh, a stop sign ceases to be meaningful if it's covered with graffiti. And a, a traffic cone, right, one of those orange cones that you get in the road, uh, if it falls over, may not be recognized as what it is. And so there are questions about the realisticness of some of the predictions that are being made. But it is at least possible that a lot of driving could shift to this technology. It may take us longer to get there than some are predicting, but we may get there. But the ethical questions are things like, you know, who would be sued if there is a collision? And in between achieving a full realization of the, pro of the technology and where we are now, there are going to be more accidents, uh, more fatalities, more uh, damage to property. And the question of who's liable is an interesting one, ethically speaking. Some would blame the programmer who creates the code, the software that is run by the uh, autonomous vehicle. Some would say that the entirety of the society, uh, whose morals are reflected in the program, share some culpability. The company, the, the manufacturer, uh, the owner, the car itself. Right? And that's an interesting question. Right? There's a terrible saying, but 
with some truth in it that guns don't kill people, people kill people. Guns, of course, make it easier to kill people, and so that's not really a, a very helpful saying. But the point being that a gun on its own doesn't kill anyone, uh, but it does make it easier for people to kill one another. A car, on the other hand, currently cannot kill anyone if it is parked properly, whereas an autonomous vehicle could. And so, could the vehicle itself be culpable? Uh, there have been a lot of cartoons that have explored this question of uh, responsibility, right? and we don't have time for those. Right? But I'd like to suggest that there's an analogy that can be made between pets and animals that people own and autonomous vehicles and other types of robots. And it's interesting that in the Middle Ages, people thought that it was appropriate to punish animals for crimes. And we see this reflected in Exodus 21 as well. But what's noteworthy is, if the, it says, if the owner of a bull that causes somebody's death was aware that it had the habit of attacking others and didn't keep it penned up, then they are to be punished. And so, much as is the case with uh, owning a dog that is, has the potential to attack people, the owner is responsible to keep it in check, to keep it leashed. If the dog manages to outsmart the owner and manages to get away despite the owner's best efforts, then the owner would at least be viewed as less culpable. And that's, that's important to think about. And it may be that we're going to have to accept that these machines that we're creating are more like pets uh, than either our tools or ourselves, and so have a certain amount of autonomy and culpability. We have a number of things that have already gotten here on the way to autonomous vehicles, it's easy to forget that things like anti-lock brakes and things of that sort actually mean that we have given up control of our vehicle to software that takes control of the brakes. We push on the brake pedal and it suggests to the software that it should stop the car. Uh, but we are not in control and it's easy to forget that because the uh, interface remains so similar to what we're used to. Autopilot on airlines, again, there's no sense in which that replaces the need for pilots, but it, it plays an important role. And so we accept that assisting human drivers is appropriate. What's next? And again, what's the place of technology if not in taking over driving, uh, which it may or may not do, of making it safer to drive? Uh, what's the, the sweet spot of uh, collaboration? And a lot of ethical dilemmas come up because there will be instances in which a collision is inevitable and if the driver, the vehicle is genuinely autonomous, it will have to decide between a number of options. And it's at this point that I want to bring in uh, Confucius and something that Confucius said in relation to the question of you know, should a vehicle, for instance, sacrifice one passenger in order to save the lives of more people outside. And there's a famous instance in which uh, somebody said to Confucius that there are people who are so righteous in uh, the, the land that he comes from that if a father steals a sheep, the son will testify against him. And Confucius said that the righteous where he comes from are different. They, they cover up for each other. And it's not as though they disagreed about these two points, but they, they disagreed about the prioritization of loyalty versus a sort of a, impartially preserving law and property rights. Should the car be loyal to its occupants? Or should it maximize survival regardless of any concerns of loyalty? 
And so what's interesting is that people have been asked what a car should do in the case of, you know, it can slam into a wall and avoid killing a bunch of people, but might kill the, the occupant. Most people would say that if you can save 10 lives, that ought to be prioritized, and yet people won't buy the car that will do that. Facial recognition technology means that it could well be that the, the computer could actually tell you that the, the person running, could, or could tell the car, could recognize that the person running across the street in front of the car is a wanted criminal. Is that less of a reason to slow down? Some have suggested that there ought to be a, a dial in the car that would allow one to, for instance, if you are altruistic, if you are happy to sacrifice your life to save others, you can turn it in that direction. But if you put your spouse and child in the car, you might feel like you want to safeguard their well-being in a way that you wouldn't necessarily prioritize your own. Should the machine ask you, and of course it's Precisely the fact that our response time is uh, so much slower than that of a machine, that is one reason why this technology seems to have the potential to save lives. Isaac Asimov famously came up with three laws of robotics, and while there have been explorations of these by ethicists and philosophers who've noted that you know, there are some shortcomings, they actually do go quite a way to at least helping us think about the kinds of rules that we could put in place to, uh, to protect ourselves and to uh, have machines function in what we consider an ethical way in our society. There is a good XKCD cartoon, which I won't read here, but it explores what happens if you put those three laws in different order. And so, once again, Asimov seemed to realize what some ethicists have realized, but what most of us don't like to think about in our day-to-day -day lives, which is the need to take those things that we consider goods, each on their own, and prioritize them in relation to one another. The trolley problem itself has sometimes been criticized as unrealistic, as not really relevant to real life, and yet, there was an article recently which said, in real life, very few people face trolley problems unless their job is literally to program collision avoidance algorithms for driverless cars. And so, this philosophical question is relevant, at least in this particular instance. Deciding who dies in advance is something we hate to think about. And yet, when we don't think about things in advance, when we don't diagram our ethics, uh, when we don't think about our inability to quantify certain goods and their relation to one another, then we miss the opportunity for serious reflection. Because it's not simply do this and this many people die, do that, and one person dies. It's swerve this way and there is a 30% chance of fatality to one individual, sort of that way, and there's a 60% chance of severe injury to three individuals, and there is no obvious way in most of our ethical systems, theistic or not, to evaluate and adjudicate between those. Computer scientists are used to dealing with hypercubes and Haas diagrams, which show decision trees, how to deal with more complex decisions. And our ethics often involve these kinds of processes, even though we don't spell them out and diagram them in this way. We are not, in most of life, faced with binary choices. And thinking about the programming of computers to behave ethically, to embed our own ethical values, helps us to think about our own ethical reasoning. We dislike a priori decisions, right? we don't want to think about these things. Uh, we find binary decisions easier than quantitative ones. Right? Should I have ice cream? Yes or no? 
How much should I have? That we find it harder to say specifically. Should a vehicle cause deaths? No. Right? But vehicles do cause deaths. And asking how many lives are likely to be lost in various technological scenarios uh, is something we can't avoid asking. We freeze in moments of crisis. And so whatever one's ethical principles, right, in uh, certain strands of Christianity, it's familiar to ask the question, what would Jesus do as a guide to ethical reasoning? And yet, in most circumstances, by the time we're, in a, we're faced with a, an immediate need for a decision, it's too late to ponder the various scenarios. We need to think about things in advance. And that, in a sense, is a lot like programming our ethics in advance into a machine. If we don't do something, many lives will be lost one way or another. And so we need to make decisions both about the potential harms of the technology that we have, but also the potential of the technology to save lives compared to what we have. And it's sometimes said, and it can be misleading, that you know, this many lives are lost due to driver error. Well, that's because the only kind of error in driving at the moment is human error. If we were to place all humans with current driverless car technology, there would be a lot of fatalities because the technology is not ready yet for that. And so working out how to save lives involves a number of steps and we'll need ethical decision making each step of the way. Uh, in the 1980s, the uh, computer and uh, movie War Games recognized that some games are unwinnable and so maybe shouldn't be played. But sometimes we have no choice but to make a decision. And it's those situations that uh, this kind of thinking, and in fact one of my favorite uh, science fiction franchises helps us to explore. And so on Star Trek, training starship captains are uh, offered a simulation as part of their training called the Kobayashi Maru. And it places them in a no-win situation when either they will ignore a distress call and not come to try to rescue uh, some uh, people who are at risk, or it will go into territory where they're likely to be attacked and could even start a war. And so I definitely recommend looking this up, uh, especially if you're a Star Trek. If you're a Star Trek fan, you already know it, but if you don't, it's, it's an interesting exploration of uh, the need for decision-making even in those no-win situations. And so the famous story is that Captain Kirk reprogrammed the computer to make it possible to win uh, because he hated to lose. And yet, if you cheat, have you really won? We need to redefine winning because sometimes it's not possible to save every life and so our machines and ourselves need to make decisions uh, that choose between two options, neither of which is ideal. And we need to decide on how we prioritize the things that we think are good. Uh, we think of free speech as a valuable thing. Uh, we think of inclusivity. Uh, we think of fairness as good things. Sometimes those are in tension with one another. What is the appropriate course of action, and when they are in tension, what do we do? Uh, another Star Trek example right, is the, the Federation's inclusivity, infinite diversity and infinite combinations, and yet when it encounters an entity like the Borg that is threatening to absorb everything else and so will obliterate that diversity, they cannot simply welcome them to become part of their diversity because that will, in fact, obliterate the diversity that's there. So, what can we learn from reflecting on artificial intelligence? Well, Marvin Minsky uh, famously said that no computer has ever, been has ever been designed that is ever aware of what it's doing. But most of the time, we aren't either. Much of our ethical and unethical action is unreflected. And so the fact that we can't program our machines to reason like us in ethical ways 
but can program them to embody and encode our ethics? Not only can help us to achieve more ethical programming and machines, but to think about our own ethics. Uh, because we understand our ethics better as we go through this process of trying to program them. And so my colleague in computer science, Ankur Gupta, uh, likes to use the term artificial wisdom for going beyond artificial intelligence to the encoding of these ethical norms in the realm of uh, computer programming. And so by thinking about our prioritization, by thinking about our decision making, uh, as well as by seeking to think about the place of things like self-sacrifice in the case of autonomous vehicles, uh, these all give us opportunities to uh, do our ethical reflection more effectively, uh, whether as professional ethicists or as individuals, and for theological ethicists to actually have an important contribution to make to the realm of computer programming in ways that have not yet been fully explored. Thank you.